That was amazing worshiping with you guys. Thank you for being here. You know, Jesus came into the world and showed us many things. One of those things, very simple truths that he reminded the human race of. One of those we sang about, there is no life apart from God. That might sound like, okay, yeah, sure, sure. I know that. If I believe in God, I know that's true. There is no life apart from God. That means it's foolish to go anywhere else to try and find it. The only source of life is the one who made you. Amen? We're doing a Father's Day message today, and we're going to start off with a little bit of a quote here from uh, Harrison Ford. All right. Are you a fan of Harrison Ford? There's some people. Yeah, so he's, he's an old man now. He's getting older. Yep. Uh, what is he well known for? Some of the young people in here, do young people know who Harrison Ford is? Do you guys? Oh, because Star Wars. Right. Okay. Who is he? Who, who is he most famous for being? What's his? Indiana Jones? Or is it Han Solo? Is it Indiana Jones or is it Han Solo? Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know who he's most famous for being. So he did an interview uh, recently in Esquire, Esquire magazine. Do they still have magazines? I don't know. I guess he's an old guy. So he got an interview with a magazine. And he had a quote, a couple of quotes in there, which are powerful and also really sad. Really sad. Um, so here's one of them. He said this, I can tell you this, if I'd been less successful, I'd probably be a better parent. So you can see connecting this idea that he was, he was caught up in what he viewed as the main mission of his life. And this is, you know, men are made to do good work in the world. That's what men are made primarily to do. We're made to do good work. Men feel like we have a mission, and that's expressed differently with different men. We have all kinds of different personalities. Men are made to do good work. We're made for a mission. And he felt like his mission was, I don't know what he felt like it was, being Indiana Jones or being Han Solo or being this super famous, ultra-successful actor. And now he's realizing, what is he realizing? That if he'd been less success, successful, he'd probably be a better parent. What do you think, as he's looking back on his life, I mean, you've got to kind of read into this a little bit. How high is he placing this mission in his life now? And what regrets does he have? Now, I'm going to give you one more quote, and he has a little bit of a swear word in his quote, so don't, don't get too crazy on me here. It's, it's blanked out. Here's what else he said. Certainly, the more constant gardener is the better parent. And I've been out of town up my own blank for most of my life. Okay? Now, the reason I share this is just to show you where he's coming from. What, what is that? I mean, I know that's, that's kind of a bad word, the way he's using it there, but what does he mean by that? He means that he was caught up in his own ego, in himself, in his own success, in his own, uh, his own fame, in his own trophies, his own... Uh, awards rather than viewing some other things that might be maybe even the most important things as a central part of the mission of his life. That's kind of a sad quote, isn't it? And you notice he's not even smiling in that photo. I don't know if he's trying to look tough and manly. He is a very tough, manly guy, but he's not even smiling in that photo. So we're doing just a little Father's Day message today, just sort of, just today. This is a mini-series that's connected to the Mother's Day message that we did, and we'll be using some of the same material. So if you didn't catch that message, I would encourage you to go back and look at that. There's really only two goals in the message today, okay? The message, it's entitled, Thank You, Dad. And there's two goals. We are going to, number one, we're going to paint a picture of of you know, how, does, how does God view children and how important is the raising of godly human beings in the eyes of our Creator? And then we're going to try to inspire dads to step up and take on that role more and more sacrificially as part of our mission, dads. It's part of our mission in the world. It's not the same as the way moms interact, but it's part of our mission and it's essential. Now, I'm not only in this message going to try to inspire dads who are already dads. I'm actually, in my mind, and as I prayed about this, I maybe even aimed more at some of the young men who are in the room and watching later. I've got a few of you in my mind 
who are caught up maybe on some of the ideas, I've got to achieve some great thing in my life. And the question is, what are the great things that God is really calling you to achieve? That's the question. There might be many. Okay, let's start out with this. And this is something we, we did last time, talking about how God loves children. If you've read your Bible, have you found some places where God loves children? Yeah, it's all over the Bible. Let's go through a few of those places and we'll see just how important children are to God. And this is something in our society, even the idea that people would have children is on the decline, isn't it? That might be just a burden on my life, right? If I have kids, well, it's going to cost me a lot of money. And I'm not going to have as much time and energy. I might not be as successful or get to have as much fun. Well, that's a confusion about what life actually is. Let's see how God views children. This is one of the points in your notes. You can write this in if you want. God reveres kids and so should you. Embrace them as part of your mission, men. Here's Malachi 2.15. And these, these first few scriptures we went over during the Mother's Day message. But I want to remind you of them again. In this part of Malachi, uh, God is rebuking men, actually, who have abandoned their wives, right? So they got married when they were young, and they had kids. And then later on, they felt like, you know what? My wife's just kind of a nag. So they ditched her, and they ditched their kids. And they went and found a better, younger wife or whatever else it is. And Malachi, God, through Malachi, the prophet, is rebuking them strongly. And look what he says here. Has not the one God made you, so that is you and the wife you married when you were young. You belong to God, to him, in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? When God created this system of men and women and marriage and children, God's the one who created that system. We didn't make it up. What was his purpose in creating that system? Godly offspring. That's what this says. God was looking for more human beings who trust him and are trying to follow after him. That's what he wants. In some ways, you could say, that's what the whole world is designed to produce. More and more human beings who love God and are trying to follow him and become like him. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. You can see this is a primary, in some ways we could even say, the primary thing God is looking for. Godly offspring. We'll jump forward into Matthew and we'll look at some Jesus stuff here. Right, this is Jesus. There are all these moments. There's a whole bunch of these moments in the Gospels. So those are the books in the Bible that are about the life and ministry of Jesus. And there's a bunch of moments where they are really busy, right? There are thousands of people trying to get to see Jesus, and they're teaching, and they're helping people. And then little kids would show up, right? And the disciples would be like, hey, kid, get out of the way, because we're busy here. And what did Jesus do in those moments? Many of you know. Jesus was like, stop everything. Stop everything. If you're too busy for this little child, then you've missed the whole point. He said this to the 12 men who were following him. Okay, here's one of those stories. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, they were always asking this question, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which of us is the best, Jesus? And he called a little child to them. He said, stop everything. You're not, your life is not about seeking a bunch of awards or trying to be the greatest one around. Stop everything. Bring me a kid. Get a kid in the middle of this circle of 12 men. And he placed the child in the middle of these 12 disciples. And he said this, truly, I tell you, I, I tell you the truth. In the Greek, this is amen, amen. Unless you change and become like one of these little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Okay, dads, young men, think about that for a minute. Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes, he continues with some verses about protection of children. And this is very important in our society today. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone 
hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Those are harsh words from Jesus. They're words about how important children are to God and how important it is that we as a society and let's say on today, Father's Day, men, young men, dads, older men, we need to protect children in our society. Amen? Here's another verse, Matthew 18.10. See that you, this is Jesus again, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, this is a really interesting verse. We don't know, this is the only verse that talks about this particular phenomenon in the entire Bible, so we're not totally sure what it means, but somehow children have a special, have special access in some way to God. It, it almost seems like in this verse, if we're going to read it in the most straightforward way, it seems like there are particular angels assigned to children who those angels have special access to God somehow in the spiritual realm. Whatever the case is, we can see, right, that children are very important. God holds them in a position of honor, importance, because of what they can become. This is Jeremiah 19. These are some more harsh verses. And this is at a time when, in ancient Israel, some people had gotten really, really confused, confused in a very evil and wicked way. And in order to make their economy better, in order to produce, they, they were hoping to get more grain out of the fields by doing this, okay? They were very confused. It seems weird to us today, except that in some ways we do the same thing, just with a little bit different theology. What the ancient Israelites were doing is sacrificing their own children so that their economy would improve. I'm not going to talk about that related to our society a whole lot, but just think about that. They're sacrificing their own children so they'd have more. They built high places. They built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it ever enter my mind. And in this, in this scene in Jeremiah 19, Jeremiah actually takes, it's very similar to what Jesus says, protection for children, right? They are, they're murdering children. And Jeremiah takes a jar, like a pot, and he smashes it. And he says, you stop this now or God is going to smash this nation like I've smashed this jar. They didn't stop. God did smash the nation. All right, all of that to say, children are super important to God. Do you see it? Super important. If that's the case, then how important is our role as fathers, the role of moms, as mothers? How important is that role? Okay, we're going to talk about this for a minute now, second part of this message. The power of a father in a fatherless world. There is an epidemic of fatherlessness in our world. Dads either not being there at all or not being there in certain ways, emotionally, mentally, enough time spent uh, in the right ways. We are in, in many ways, a fatherless world. What are the results of that? Let's take a minute and just look at some stats here. Now, I'm not going to take the time, like I, I usually don't take the time to quote where all the stats are from. I just put up a few places where some of these statistics came from. Uh, the Gospel Coalition compiled a whole bunch of them. There's a thing called the Fatherhood Project, Psychology Today. There's a whole bunch of stats about the impact of not having a dad or not having a dad that's fully present. Or, positively, the impact of a dad who is there and who is present with his kids and with his wife. Okay? And some of these, we're going to read these over, and at first you're going to think, oh, that's nice. And then you're going to think about each of these and realize that the impact of a, a father being present with his family and with his children in the right ways is greater than the impact of so many other things that our society tries to pour energy into. Listen to this first stat, okay? Fathers positively impact child development, leading to sociability, confidence, and self-control. Okay, so you read that. Everybody say, yeah, that's nice, and that's nice. Now think about what it means. Okay, so kids are going to develop better if they have a dad who's present. They're going to develop into more confident, competent adults. How long will that have an impact on the world? Like forever, right? This is one of the things our government right now is trying to pour money into early childhood development. 
Right? Really what we need, one of the biggest things we need is more fathers to be present and active. Right? It's leading to sociability. What does that mean? That means they're going to know how to relate to other people. People are going to start to get to law. What, what does that mean 20 years from now? It means people are going to know how to get along in society better. Confidence, self-control. These things are extremely important. Next one. Children with engaged fathers have better career success, more lasting marriages, and better stress management skills. How important are those things? I mean, we pour huge amounts of money into education in our country. But kids have better career success if they just have a dad who's present with them. How, how valuable is it that someday, in the future, say 20 years from now, 30 years from now, there are many people in our society whose marriages, number one, who actually have marriages, and then number two, marriages that last. How valuable is that to our nation? It is invaluable. You cannot calculate how valuable that is. Father's involvement improves academic performance and sociability of children. Here's an important one for if you're a believer. You're here today in church. You're watching with us online. God is an important thing to you. Father's religiosity improves parent-child relationships. That's something that's been demonstrated in studies. So dads who believe in God and go to church and try to become more like God, you're reading the Bible, you're going to have a better relationship with your kids. Not only that, I mean, there's another one we could say on here that I couldn't find an exact uh, statistical quote for, but children often live up to who they view their dads to be. And if your children know that you are a man who follows after God, even though you do it imperfectly and you mess up again and again, it is very likely that your children are going to aspire to be the same. They're going to aspire to be people who follow after God. Involved fathers reduce school behavior issues and risky behaviors in adolescence. I love how, how many euphemisms we have in our studies and statistical quotes, okay? What is school behavior issues? That's like getting in fights and not, not listening to your teacher, maybe throwing chairs around, getting called to the office. That's some bad stuff. And when dads are present, there's way less of that bad stuff. You don't even necessarily have to do very much. You just have to be a dad who's present and try your best. Risky behaviors in adolescence. What does this mean? It means like, yeah, sex and drugs and alcohol, all kinds of stuff. All that stuff plummets if a dad is present in the lives of his children. How important are fathers in the mission? It's different than moms. Okay, I mean, here's basically the difference, right? Mom gives the kids life. If you don't have mom, you don't have kids, period, right? She nurtures them. The kids will probably die without mom, right? She's got to be there so that they're alive. But without dad, the kids don't become who they're made to be in the same way. So your role, I mean, your role might be in some cases, dad, to keep them alive. Dads often protect their kids. That's less and less these days, thank God. But calling them to be who they were made to be. So our point here you can write down, step up, dads. Your presence can change the world. When you change how a child grows up and how, who they become as they grow up, you change the world actually forever. How does that compare with all the other missions you might have in your life? Let's read a few verses here. This is, of course, Genesis 2. Um, this is... You know, how God set things up, this is right after God creates Adam and Eve. And we talked recently, some of us talked about how this is, this is the first marriage, the first wedding ceremony that comes right before this. And then it says in Genesis 2, 24, that is why, because of the way God created men and women to be together, that is why a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So the husband, the husband and wife, the father and the mother of the, eventually the children who will be there are both very, very essential for the plan that God has to bring godly children into the world. Let's read the next one. Interesting, the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. We already read one quote from Malachi in chapter 2 about how God is seeking godly offspring. 
Here's one that shows us just the importance of fathers in particular. Now, sometimes when we read this same verse on Mother's Day, I actually had a little bit different translation. And instead of fathers, we had, we had parents there. And this word that's translated here, it is literally the word for fathers. But of course, in ancient languages, there was no word for parents. So the word for fathers can also mean mother and father, sort of collectively. But it literally means fathers here. And listen to what Malachi says here. And it, this is interesting. What is, some of you Bible scholars out there, this is a prophecy. And what is he predicted right before this? Anybody know what comes right before this? The prediction that someone would come to prepare the way for the Messiah. It's actually the prediction of the Elijah who would come, who would eventually be John the Baptist. I, we won't go into detail about that today. But here's why Elijah came, uh, or John the Baptist came, in the spirit of Elijah. And it shows us how important the relationship of fathers and children are. So he, the one who would, who would come, who was being prophesied, will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the hearts of the children to their fathers. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. What? So this was before the Messiah could come, before Jesus could come, one of the preparations that had to happen was that dads had to have their hearts toward their children instead of being separated from their children, being angry with their children, being disconnected from their children. This was essential before the Messiah came. And the results of it not happening one of the things, the subtext here, is that if this is not the case, if fathers are not, in general, actively present, loving their children, uh, sacrificing for their children, what's going to happen is total destruction. And we see that in societies throughout history, and we see that today in some of those statistics that we already read. This is vital. It is essential what are dads supposed to do? I mean, we talked about dads just being present. Here's an interesting verse that shows us, uh, Ephesians 6, 4, one of the verses that shows us just how dads are supposed to be. How is it that a dad's heart can be toward his children and his children's hearts toward him? Well, it's, it's really hard to live out. You're going to need God's grace and his help every moment to live this out. But it's actually pretty simple to describe. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 6. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You are there to call them to become who they were made to be. Right? What is, as the kids get older, how is mom, what does mom always say? Right? When she sees, when mom sees pictures of the kids, the kids are now teenagers. When the kids, she sees pictures of the kids when they were like four years old, what does she say? Oh, that's so great. And then what else does she say? I wish they were still that little, okay? Dad is the other voice. Dad is the other voice. Become who you were made to be. Dad, the dad, dad is the one who is excited as the kids, I mean, mom is excited too, don't get me wrong, but dad is primarily the one who is champion, champion, championing the children as they grow and become who they were made to be as they take those milestones, as they launch into adulthood, calling them out, it's time to move to that next stage of life. Dads, if you've got older teenagers, do not let them just fail to launch and sit around at your house forever. Call them to that next stage of life. Go be a man. Go be a man. Take those steps so that you eventually can become a father too. Or a mother. Okay, this is powerful. This is powerful. So this is a very important thing, right? We're talking about the power of a father in a fatherless world in the second section. We're going to do one more section of this message. But dads, I want you to see here, so, God, so, so far what we said is this, God loves children. They are extremely important to him. Godly children is one of the things God is looking for out of the world. That's one of the fruits that he's looking for. And then we said, okay, dads, it's not just whatever. Yes, ma if you check out, mom can take care of the kids and keep them alive and do, she can do all of her part and those kids will be missing something vital without you. You have to be present and fully engaged. This is vitally important for the future history of the world. 
You have to be leading them to become men and women of God in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's super important. You need to view it, as we said earlier, as part of your mission. Right? We saw Harrison Ford miss that his whole life, and now he's starting to wake up to that. Young men, wake up to it now. This is probably, not everyone's called to be a dad, although I think everyone's called, within the church, everyone's called to be, if you're a man, you're called to be a dad in some way. Wake up to it now. This is part of your mission. Finally, what's it going to take, right? This is not just easy. And one of the reasons that... One of the reasons that dads, uh, people today, uh, young people especially, are thinking, you know, maybe it's, it looks like a really hard thing to be a parent, to be a mom or a dad in today's world. There's society doesn't really support that as much as it used to. We feel like maybe we're on our own. Uh, young people often don't feel prepared. I have so many young adults and uh, teenagers who have said to me over the years, I just don't feel like I know how to be a mom or a dad or even to be a grown-up, much less a parent. Right? So how can I possibly do it? So there are all these pressures on young people that might, it might feel like the cost is just too high to become a parent, become a mother or a father. But remember what we've been talking about. We've been talking about in our series on Romans. We had that key verse in Romans 12.1. We are called, if we are followers of Jesus, we are called to offer ourselves because of God's mercy. We are called to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And that is what it's going to take to be the kind of dad that God is calling you to be. It's going to take some of the stuff we heard about in that song earlier. That second song we did, I Lay Me Down, right? Giving up my pride, giving up my rights. Why would I do that? Why would I give up my rights and my pride? I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Another way we could kind of paraphrase this last piece, this is the only reasonable thing that you can do given the way the world actually is. See, I mean, here's how it is. We said, I said it at the beginning of the message. There's only one source of life in all of existence. What is the source of life? It's God himself. He is the only source we, be, we talk about the gospel all the time here, and we need to keep talking about it more and more. He's the one who made us. He's the source. He loves us. We all turned away from him and spiraled into a disaster as a human race. There is only one way back. God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. He died for us on the cross so that now if we put our faith in him, God will forgive us, and we can enter into a life with him. Amen? And now, in that new life, you can live the way that you were made to live. It's not going to be perfect. It's still going to be messy. And it's that life involves, just like it involved for Jesus, right? He actually was the living sacrifice. The one who, while still alive, was crucified willingly so that we could be, we could be set free and brought into a relationship with God. And that's the path forward. We've talked about that. The only reasonable thing to do, Paul says here, with your life is it doesn't make any sense. If Jesus is who he says he is and there really is a God, and those things are true, if you're not sure, keep wrestling with it. Keep praying. Ask God to show you. But if those things are really true, then living for yourself makes no sense at all. It only ends in disaster and death. It only ends in darkness. The only thing that makes any sense is to lay down your life in service to God and the people around you. And then what's going to happen is God is going to fill your life with power. Your life is going to overflow, like we've been talking about, into the people around you, into your children, and then into others, many others, through them and through the, uh, those you have touched, you've changed. So let me ask you a couple of questions, Dad. If you're a dad or maybe you think, oh, I might be a dad someday. You have this desire in you to be great and do great things in your life, to change the world and make it a better place. Do you have that desire in you? You can say yes, whether you're a man or a woman. Do you have that desire in you? 
Yes. Which would you choose if you had to choose between these two? Would you choose to change the world or to appear to change the world? Now, you might, what am I talking about here? You might get to do both, okay? Sometimes people who really make a lasting change to, to the world get credit for that. But sometimes they don't. And what if you had to choose either to, to be a person who's really changed the world for the better, made it a better place, and gets no credit for it in the eyes of our society? Or a person who's really done not much of anything, but our society honors you and praises you and pretends like you've changed the world. Which would you choose if you had to choose between the two? Because often today, being a dad, sacrificially laying your life down as a father is a thankless job in a lot of ways in our culture. Harrison Ford spent much of his life focused on this, didn't he? Did Indiana Jones really make the world a better place? Some of you are going to be like, yeah, he did, yes. Han Solo. I mean, I know some of you guys are really caught up in Star Wars. I mean, it's just, it's just a made-up story, guys. It's not that cool. It's really not that cool. That whole may the force be with you, that's, that's just made up. But there is a real Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God himself who's here with us now. That's real. Which would you rather? Another way we could put it is this. Would you rather spend your life achieving big trophies, rewards, success, the praise of the world, or would you rather spend your life under God's grace producing good human beings? Be a sacrificial father. This is the last point you can write down in your notes. Be a sacrificial father. I call you out today to leave a lasting legacy. I'm going to wrap up with one story here. This is a story about myself and becoming a dad. So as a young adult, I became a Christian. I became a follower of Jesus when I was in my early 20s. And then I met my wife when I, I don't know how old, I was probably 23 when we met, something like that. Got married when I was 20, when I was 23? 24, yeah. We met when I was 23. And some of you will know, does anybody know my son Carter? Some of you know him. He's off uh, serving in the, U the U.S. Marines in Japan right now. He's a pretty good guy. We like him. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of pieces to that story. But I became his dad. I, I'm actually, technically, I'm his stepdad. Um, although he is Carter Whiting now, which is a, a wonderful thing. He changed his last name when he became an adult. Um, I met him, I became his dad when he was two years old. And there was a period there where I, I had met Amber, uh, who would become my wife, and I felt like God was calling me to marry her. And I, I felt like God was calling me to step up and take on this role as an instant dad. And yet, I could see very clearly all the things that I wanted for myself that, that I knew that that was going to cost me. Now, don't get me wrong. Being a dad is is one of the greatest things that could ever happen to you in your life, ever. But I could also see what it was going to cost me. Money, time, things I'd be able to do or achieve in my life. You can only put your time and energy into so many things. And kids take up a lot of that, especially if they're already there from the moment you get married. And so I was wrestling with this. I was wrestling with this. I was praying regularly, probably every day. Like, can I take this on? I was scared to take it on. And I went to a worship night. And I don't know if, does anybody know who this is, Jason Upton? This is a worship leader I was really into uh, when I was a young adult. And I went to this worship night that he led. And I was just sitting there praying. And he sang this song. And he, he has a song, and it's called, Is There Room? And I'm going to read you the lyrics from this song as I was deeply in worship and prayer that night, thinking about, am I going to take on this thing that God's calling me to? And as we read the lyrics, you can also think about uh, moms and young women one day maybe becoming mothers, if that's something God leads you to. You can think about the table that we have for the Pregnancy Options Center. We're, we're finishing up a fundraiser for them. That's a group that helps young women have an option not to have an abortion. That is, not to medically kill the baby, but to let babies live and raise them. Let me show you the lyrics to this song. 
Is there room in your womb, young woman? Is there room in your womb for a child? I've seen the prophecies being fulfilled. I've heard the song of the angels. God is sending peace and goodwill. But is there room? You can see the song is structured around the Christmas story. I know it's not Christmas time. But, of course, Mary and Joseph had to face this same question, too. Are they going to receive what God is calling them to? Is it going to be hard? It's going to be like a living sacrifice. Is it going to be worth it? God, he's seen the prophecies being fulfilled. Through whom? Through the children that God will bring into the world if they're raised the right way. And then he said this. Is there room in your inn, young man. And on that night, for me, what that was is, what is the inn? The inn is the place of business, right? It's the, the owner of the inn who, of course, kicks out Mary and Joseph and the baby. There's no space in the inn for them, famously in the Christmas story. The inn is what? His place of business. It's his work. It's his mission in the world. Is there room in my work, in my mission in the world? Is there room to take in a child? Is there room in your inn Young man, how long will we push our children away? Is there room in our world for a new word today? A holy child from God's right hand is a holy word from God to man. But is there room? Let's pray.